Right, so today's lecture is about uh, growth morphologies, that means about the shapes of precipitates. And I'm going to start off with uh, looking at the solidification process. And this is a picture of an ingot, that means a casting, which has been cut into half. And obviously this was done by pouring metal into a mold which surrounded this object. And the stuff that you see in the middle is a big hole because of the shrinkage of the liquid as it solidifies. But what I'd like you to notice is that right at the edge, there are some very, very fine crystals. Okay? Because as you pour the molten metal into the mold, you get very quick freezing at the surfaces of the mold. And that stimulates a lot of crystals to nucleate. So we have a very fine zone of grains, which we call the chill zone because it has been cooled very quickly. And then, uh, heat is extracted through the walls of the mold, and therefore we get the growth of many of those small crystals towards the center of the mold. And then we have a slightly different structure in the middle of the mold. And I'll illustrate that with a small movie. So this is a, actually a simulation of exactly the process that I was describing. Uh, you can see the very fine grains here, and that some of these grains then continue to grow into the middle, but there are many of these grains which are cut off before they reach, reach the middle. Can you see all these grains which are cut off? So the structure in the middle is much coarser than near the walls of the surface. And I'll explain why that is the case. So if we start this simulation again, you can see the ev evolution of the structure. The reason why these are curved like this is simply because of the direction of heat flow. Now, the reason why some of these grains get cut off is because those grains which have their fastest growth direction along the direction of heat flow will win at the expense of those whose fastest growth direction is not parallel to the heat flow. So, just schematically, we have this chill zone with in incredibly fine grains. Uh, then we have a coarser region of these columnar grains, which are basically growing along the direction of heat flow. And if, if we have a region in the middle where nucleation can happen, then we will also get growth of grains starting from the center of the mold. Now, that can happen only if there is a negative temperature gradient in the liquid. That means the liquid ahead of the boundary is actually supercooled, so that solidification is favored. And that could happen if we evolve a huge amount of latent heat of solidification at the interface. In general, the temperature gradient will be like this because you are withdrawing heat from the solid into the mold. And the liquid ahead of the interface will be hotter than at the interface, right? But there are circumstances when, in a pure material, we might end up with a negative temperature gradient, in which case you will nucleate grains also in the middle of the mold, and we will get that strange structure that I showed you in the real income. Yeah. Now, imagine that we have this negative temperature gradient. If I put a small perturbation at the interface, then that will actually be growing into supercooled liquid, won't it? So that perturbation will become unstable, it will grow. In this case, if I put a perturbation on the interface, that means a disturbance, and that perturbation advances into hotter liquid, it will dissolve. So this is a case where the interface will tend to, expand, uh, tend to grow as a flat interface and any disturbance on the interface will tend to dissolve because it's advancing into hotter liquid. In this case, any disturbance will become unstable. And we get a mode of solidification which is known as dendritic solidification. So it tends to branch out into many directions like this. Okay. In the center of that mold where we have a negative temperature gradient. So this is called dendritic because it looks like a tree, basically, in three dimensions. Okay. 
And again, I, I have a, a movie to show you a simulation of dendritic solidification. So we're starting solidification from here, and we have a, a negative temperature gradient, and you can see huge amount of branching going on, branching of the crystal, because every time you have a perturbation, it tends to advance into supercooled liquid. Now, notice one other thing, is that, look, we have crystals being stifled because they are not growing in the direction of maximum heat flow. So, so much for movies. Let me show you how good this simulation is. By showing you real dendritic solidification. <coughs> and this is, you'll actually see it happening. This is a, a material called a succino nitrile, which is transparent. So we can photograph it while it's solidifying. And you'll see exactly all those processes happening. So you see the stifling of dendrites, which are not growing in the optimum direction. You can see that one got cut off, okay. and there's lots and lots of uh, branching going on. So, this is a case where we are getting interface instability. That's what we are describing. You know, when a perturbation tends to grow, that means the interface is unstable. And that's when we get dendritic solidification. Does this actually put at the same rate in which the movie was moving on? Was it that is real time. That's a real time. It's real time. But I mean, it's artificial. You can change the rate by altering yeah, the conditions. Yeah, you can alter conditions of solidification and so on. Yeah. Is there anyone Greek word here? Yeah. Dendros in Greek means tree. Here is a, uh, an example of a dendrite of ice which is in water. And the next one is surprising. It will be a dendrite of water in ice. So supposing you are living in very cheap accommodation, which has no central heating, yeah. and you form this ice on the window in winter. When it starts to thaw, you will be able to see dendrites of water inside that sheet of ice. And they will look like this. Okay. So these are dendrites of water. This is actually water. And it's the water ice interface which is a bit unstable. And notice that every one of these has a hole in it. Why is that? Why does every dendrite of water have a hole, whereas there are no holes in the dendrites of ice? Yeah. We are very lucky that water is denser than ice. If it was not, then the earth would be frozen because the ice would sink into the water and it would never melt. So you build up ice, ice throughout the oceans. And the only reason why ice is less dense than water is because the molecule H2O, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we have O and H and H. It's bent. So it's like magnetism in iron. I explained to you that we wouldn't get civilization if we didn't have magnetism in iron. And the second most important thing is that the molecule of water is bent and therefore ice floats on water. <coughs> now, everything I've said is for a pure material. That we get dendritic solidification when we have a negative temperature gradient. But in practice, even when we have a positive temperature gradient, in impure materials, we tend to get dendritic solidification. This is the most common mode of solidification, dendritic. So why, when we have a positive temperature gradient ahead of the interface, so this is now a plot of the temperature in the liquid, yeah, that's positive, and yet we get dendritic solidification. Well, let's have a look at solidification happening. So here we have a phase diagram. We have liquid, solid, and this is the two-phase field, which has a mixture of solid and liquid. And this is the equilibrium composition of the solid and the equilibrium composition of the liquid, plotted over here as a 
function of position. So here is the solid and this is the liquid. Okay, everyone happy about that? And this is how the temperature varies ahead of the solid-liquid interface. The dashed line represents the true temperature. But if you look at the space diagram, the solidification temperature, which we call the liquidus temperature, okay, that means if I have a liquid of this composition, it will start solidifying at this temperature. If my liquid is richer in solid, then it starts solidification at a lower temperature. That's the reason why when you put salt on roads, the ice melts, because the freezing temperature of salty water is lower than of pure water. Okay. So in fact, the freezing temperature varies with the solid content. So if I plot the freezing temperature now as a function of the solid concentration, then it follows a curve like this. So notice there is a region here where the actual temperature is below the freezing temperature. So this is what we call a constitutionally supercooled zone. Constitutionally supercooled zone. So it's gone below its freezing temperature simply because the solid concentration is varying with distance because the composition of the solid is different from that of the liquid, so we partition solid and produce a composition profile like this. Yeah? Now, of course, the bigger this zone is, the more likely you are going to get constitutional supercooling. That means if this actual temperature gradient is gentler, then I will have a larger supercooled zone, and if it is uh, if the gradient of the temperature is greater than the gradient of the liquidus temperature here, then I will not get dendritic solidification. And somewhere in between, I get what's known as cellular solidification, where the dendrites try to develop, but the supercooled zone is really quite small. So you get a structure like this instead of a branching structure. I might have a movie to show that. One more attempt to find it. Yeah. So this is what you call cellular solidification, where the dendrites don't really have much room to behave in an unstable manner because the constitutionally supercooled zone is quite small. That's the supercooled zone. So in this case, we are developing different morphologies. Morphology means shape of crystals because of the variation of the freezing temperature as a function of solid concentration. You happy with that? Uh, excuse me. Yeah. If I compare the velocity of the growth of the ventures and the velocity of diffusion, uh, which one is faster? Uh, the velocity of what? The first one? Uh, the growth of the ventures. Right, right. So, in each, everywhere where there is an interface, whether it's a branch or whether it's the main body of the dendrite, you will get partitioning of solid. So you will have diffusion controlling the growth. With solidification, there's another factor, and that is that when it happens very rapidly, you will also have to take account of heat diffusion, because you are releasing latent heat of solidification. But you will get growth of the interface being controlled by diffusion, whether it's heat or solid, even if it's branching. So I can't answer 
the question that is the dendrite growing faster than the solute? Of course, if I freeze it very rapidly, then I will trap the solute in the dendrite. And in that case, the interface is moving faster than solute can diffuse around. Yeah. So if you want to avoid dendritic solidification, we simply have to make this gradient here greater than the liquidus temperature gradient. Uh, and this is to show what happens when you have a very narrow constitutionally supercooled zone. You get cellular solidification as opposed to dendritic solidification. <coughs> now, that was when we have solid liquid transitions. We now go into solid state transformation. And in the solid state, things become more complicated. The reason being that a fluid can flow. So a fluid cannot support any shear stresses. So even if there's a volume change or a change in shape of the transforming region, there isn't any strain energy, right? Because the liquid will simply flow to accommodate the shape and size of the solid phase. Now when we get a phase change inside the solid state, it's a completely different story. The surrounding <coughs> solid material will be strained in some cases. And there are two basic ways in which you can get one crystal growing inside another crystal in the solid state. So let's imagine that this is our parent phase, and we have two kinds of atoms, the square atoms and the round atoms. And the unit cell of the parent crystal structure is this rectangular cell. Now, the first thing I can do is I can break all the bonds, right, and rearrange them into the crystal structure of the product phase. So this is now a different crystal structure without changing the external shape. Okay. So that's like when we have a fluid solidifying. We don't actually, supposing we freeze water in a container, we don't change the shape of the container apart from a volume change. Okay. So here we have changed the crystal structure by breaking all the bonds and rearranging the atoms into this shape without changing the external shape. So there is, there is almost no strain energy involved in this process. We will allow diffusion to happen to get a rearrangement of the crystal structure. And because diffusion has happened, there is an opportunity for atoms to go into the phases which they prefer to be in. So we've ended up with more square atoms on this side than we had in the parent phase with no square atoms left in the parent phase. So elements will redistribute between the phases during what we call a reconstructive transformation. Some people call it a diffusional transformation. <coughs> but there is another way of changing the crystal structure and that is by physically deforming it into a different pattern. Yeah. So here we have this unit cell and we have it's deformed into a different pattern. And of course, if the arrangement of atoms changes without diffusion, then the whole shape of the crystal will also change. So imagine that this is happening inside a bulk of material, a solid lump of material. It's going to cause a lot of strain because there's material surrounding this. So this is a, a case where the transformation is dominated by strain energy. And the product phase will form in a way which minimizes the strain energy. So the shape is determined by strain energy. And the other thing is that there's, because there's no diffusion, there's no change in the neighbors of the atom. So if you look over there, this sequence is exactly the same as this sequence. So it retains a memory of the arrangement of atoms in the parent phase. And if I reverse the transformation, I regain the original shape. Yeah? So. So, have you heard about shape memory metals? Yeah. So, you know, these are not shape memory glasses, but if they were, I could crush them and then put them in hot water and they would recover. Yeah? You've heard about that, right? That's exactly this. So, the mechanism of transformation involves a deformation of the lattice into a different structure. And if I reverse that by heating or whatever, then I recover the shape. 
And there is a, a very good analogy for these two different kinds of transformations. The, the displacive transformation which I talked about is known as a military transformation. So imagine we have a queue of soldiers here, labeled, and they board military transport. They will be ordered to board in a particular sequence, and they will be sitting next to neighbors, whether they like them or not. They have to stay in that sequence. Okay? It's a highly disciplined boarding of the bus. So there's a lot of strain energy there. On the other hand, if you have a queue of civilians, as soon as the bus arrives, they will rush onto it in a disorderly manner, sit next to their friends. So it really does minimize strain energy. But we've lost all atomic correspondence. We don't know where this person came from in the actual queue. There's a third kind of transformation where we have a mixture of large atoms and small atoms. And the small atoms behave like civilians, whereas the large atoms behave in a highly disciplined way. And that's known as a paramilitary transformation. So these have an atomic correspondence, whereas they have chosen to sit next to their friends. So all these mechanisms of transformation actually happen, and at some stage we will deal with them. <coughs> so the essence of a displacive transformation is the strain energy. If I transform this crystal by displacive transformation with only air surrounding this, then this will be the shape and the strain energy will be zero. But if it is a constrained transformation, that means I have solid material around here, then it will form as a very thin plate. Because a thin plate minimizes the strain energy. Now why is that the case? Why does a thin plate minimize the strain energy? Where did I put my duster? Anybody see the duster? No? Okay. That's why I don't have to write a lot. So this is the parent phase. And when it transforms by displacive transmission, this is the change in shape. And the shear strain is simply this distance divided by this distance. And it's the same whatever location I pick. So the shear strain, S, is simply this distance x divided by the height y. Okay. But the displacement, the actual displacement is smaller as I go towards this plane. Here, the displacement is large. So if I make my plate into a thin shape like this, then I basically am minimizing the strain energy due to those displacements. So whenever we have displacive transformation like this, you will always see the transformation product as a thin plate. Everyone happy with that? Now, in the earlier slides, I showed you that dendrites were like sort of tree-shaped. And all the examples that I illustrated to you the interfacial energy was independent of orientation. I mean, I've emphasized to you that a crystal is not isotropic. The properties vary in different directions. Right? Uh, so it makes sense that the surface energy of the crystal also varies with the orientation of that interface. So if it's a 1, 0, 0 plane, it might have a different interface energy than a 1, 1, 1 plane. So, when that orientation dependence is very strong, even the dendrite will have crystallographic facets okay, to minimize the surface energy. So in this case, this is a dendrite of niobium carbide, which is a cubic F lattice. And you can see that the dendrite has developed strong crystallographic facets. First of all, the main growth direction is 1, 0, 0. You can see that six directions corresponding to the cube edges. And then it's developed facets on different crystallographic planes which minimize the total interface energy. So the shape here is being determined by minimization of interface energy. Is this a PMM? Yeah, sorry? Most of the PMM?
Uh, this is actually a scanning electron microscope. Uh, scanning electron microscope has the advantage that we have a huge depth of field. That means that uh, we can focus the image even though we are moving quite a long distance into the sample. So this, this object here, this is 5 micrometers, is more than 20 micrometers in size, and yet every part of it appears to be in focus. Yeah. So that's the reason why we use the scanning electron. Now the way that uh, we normally think about surface energy minimization is that what do you think is the equilibrium shape of a bubble? Yeah. Why hexagonal? Oh, I was just thinking of bubbles that are constrained. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so a single bubble. Okay. A single bubble would be a sphere, right? Uh, and the reason why it's a sphere. The reason why it's a sphere is because its surface energy is independent of orientation. But if the surface energy depends on orientation, then the equilibrium shape will no longer be a sphere. And the way we express that is as follows, that this is when we have isotropic surface energy. If I now plot the surface energy as a function of orientation, and I take the size of this vector to correspond to the interface energy of a plane which is normal to that vector. Okay. So this is, let's say, sigma 100, zero zero, where sigma is the interface energy per unit area for the 100 zero zero planes. And then I have a different interface energy here. This is sigma 010. Zero zero. The magnitude of that vector tells me the magnitude of the interface energy and the direction is normal to the plane. By drawing all these vectors, I can plot a diagram which shows how the interface energy varies with crystallographic orientation. So if I have an interface in this orientation, I draw a vector at 90 degrees to it and that gives me the value of surface energy. Okay? So this is known as a gamma plot. It's plotting the surface energy as a function of orientation. Any vector from the origin gives me the magnitude of the surface energy and it is normal to the plane that we are looking at. Now, in this case, obviously, that is the minimum in interface energy. That is the minimum in interface energy and so forth. And there is a theorem known as the uh, Wolf theorem which says that, look, if you construct planes which are at 90 degrees to those cusps, this is a, called a cusp, then that gives you the equilibrium shape of the precipitate. So if you know this function, how the surface energy varies as a function of orientation, then you can work out the equilibrium shape, in other words, the shape which minimizes the surface energy. And for reconstructive transformations where strain doesn't dominate, the shape, basically it's minimization of surface energy which governs the shape. And that's why, you know, when you allow crystals to grow very, very slowly in the center of the earth and so forth, they come out with beautiful facets because they are, that's the equilibrium shape which minimizes surface energy. Any questions? I told you it was going to be an easy lecture. <laughs>